Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Um, we, this is the UBC Learning Circle. Uh, we're based uh, at the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, which is located on uh, the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. We are generously funded uh, by the uh, FNHA, First Nations Health Authority, and uh, we are a program uh, featuring work workshops on First Nations physical, mental, spiritual, and emotional health and wellness. Uh, the Learning Circle prioritizes First Nations knowledge sharing uh, among health professionals, community members, elders, students, and youth. Uh, and uh, hello, this is my first session. Uh, my name is Aurelia Kinslow. Uh, my uh, background is Cherokee, Choctaw, African American, and Scandinavian. I was raised in uh, Paris, France, and Hawaii, and I have been living uh, on Coast Salish territory, Musqueam territory, for seven years uh, doing my doctorate. I'm very happy to be here today with uh, Evelyn George and Danette Juvenville. Uh, and Evelyn George is the Indigenous Lead for the Midwives Association of British Columbia, and Danette Juvenville is the founding member of Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective. In this wonderful session, we'll be exploring the past and present roles of doulas and midwives in our communities. Our conversation will be based on what midwives do after birth and what this can mean to families and to whole communities, which of course ties in with supporting families through difficult times as well. Danette and Evelyn, do you like Hi. to introduce yourself? Thanks for having us. Sure. <laughs> Should we go right into our slideshow? Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Unless you want to say a bit more about uh, your background or how you got into what you're doing, if you'd like. Yeah, we will. Um, so we'll do that. Well, first of all, I'll start um, by acknowledging the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people, um, whose homelands uh, we are located on today. It's been, for myself, I did my undergrad here at UBC in First Nation Studies, and it's really been an honor to um, live and learn um, on Musqueam territory. So, um, miigwech for that. And um, I guess, yeah. Um, I'm Danette Chubinville, um, thanks Aurelia, and um, my family is um, Cree and Soto from the Pasqua First Nation and Treaty 4 Territory on my dad's side and on my mom's side um, we're German, Jewish, and Scottish. Um, I've had the privilege of being born and raised here in Coast Salish Territory um, and now I'm raising my daughter here as well. Her name is Keeston and she's 21 months old and um, currently working on my master's in health sciences um, at SFU, focusing on indigenous maternal health in Toronto, and um, also a founding member of the Equatal Indigenous Doula Collective. Thank you. Awesome. Um, thanks for that, you guys. I'd like to also acknowledge the day and where we are, and so um, we're having a beautiful sunny day here. I'm just so grateful for that. My name is Evelyn George. I am from Ontario. I'm Nipissing Anishinaabe and French Canadian, and I am living in the Okanagan or Seal territories. And I'm very pleased to be here on Musqueam territory, joining you, awesome people, uh, today. Um, so I'm also the co-chair for the National Aboriginal Council of Midwives and Indigenous lead for the Midwives Association of BC, and I'm a midwife myself. And I come from a family of midwives on both sides, which is kind of cool, and just happy to be here. Mm -hmm. um, so, should we dig right in? Sure. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Alright, so um, we just wanted to begin by setting out some of the terminology. So, um, I'll just um, talk about what a doula is. So, a doula is a caregiver who provides um, non-clinical, physical, mental, um, emotional and spiritual support through the full spectrum of possible pregnancy outcomes, which includes um, pregnancy, birth, postpartum, adoption, miscarriage, abortion, stillbirth, and um, or perinatal loss. And a midwife is a primary care provider who provides clinical care of a well person through pregnancy, labor, and birth, postpartum, and newborn periods. And so the term postpartum, when we're talking about that, we're referring to the time after a baby's been born and refers to the parent who's given birth primarily. And it may be specified like the first six weeks postpartum or the first year postpartum. And, and so a lot of people will hear postpartum and assume we're referring to depression. And depression can be part of that postpartum time. 
and when we're talking about that we'll say postpartum depression um, otherwise when we're talking about postpartum we're talking about that period in your life after the baby's arrived so I don't know if how many people we have online today or or what's what's going on with the community but we wanted to put some reflection questions out to the group today what's 29 that? 29, 29 webinar and, oh, cool. and more on the uh, video conference Hi everyone. So we wanted to put out some reflection questions to kind of get some active discussion happening before we go really into the what it is that we do part and just reflect a bit on the, the postpartum time and, and um, what makes the postpartum time so unique in a person's life or in a family's life and for the whole community. So I'd like to put that out to you guys to, to um, think a little bit about why is that such a unique time in life. Would you like to um, let some questions come in? Yeah. Yeah. The other question we have up to are what are the potential challenges of the postpartum time and what are the potential strengths? So what can come out of that in a good way and what can be challenging for people in, in that time in their lives? And so feel free to use uh, the chat, the chat uh, function to uh, send us some of your thoughts on that. We're happy to share. Cheryl Sargent is taken. Is it picking up? Do we have any comments there? Or do you Not want yet. To keep the discussion um, going? No, we need to keep the so discussion going. How see. about you, Danette? So the people that you are involved with in, in your care as a doula, what kind of things come out in terms of challenges and, and strengths? Sure. So um, I think the postpartum period is very unique in that it's an extremely like transformative um, and sacred and challenging time of a person's and a family's life. Um, some of the specific challenges that seem to arise, I think, um, are especially related to breastfeeding, um, to the transformation of family roles, um, lack of sleep, um, trying to, um, or feeling obligated to keep up with chores or hosting, like as you would have before baby came, um, challenges around supports and family supports and um, even just feeding yourself um, and then also there's some big challenges around navigating the healthcare system especially for families who um, may have um, had more medical interventions during birth like um, cesarean sections or who have to go back return to the hospital or can't leave the hospital right away um, like for myself um, my daughter had jaundice and we had to return the hospital to the hospital and so um, navigating all of that um, with all the healthcare professionals um, was challenging and then there's some bureaucratic things as well like just paperwork for birth certificates and names and all of that stuff yeah it's a big time did we get any others there i have a couple thoughts myself we had someone who um who mentioned that uh, the potential potential challenges are postpartum depression on the one hand yeah mm -hmm. And we have lack of support on so many levels if a woman has been evacuated to give birth and is alone in the city. Mm -hmm. Oh, totally. That's, that's a super tough, a tough one. Mm -hmm. um, and, and not knowing what to do. Sometimes people just feel like, I don't know what to do now. Mm -hmm. right. I don't know who I am. I've changed so much in just such a brief period of time. There's just so much shifting happening. And then not knowing how to ask for help. Mm -hmm. And it's been the case, um, you know, we, we hear a lot of our Indigenous or First Nations people who say, I don't know, I'm afraid to ask for help because they're worried they're going to look like they're not doing a good job when they're parenting. They feel threatened. Uh, they feel like their family is, is threatened by just reaching out for help. And it's a time where everybody needs a lot of help. So that can be really challenging too. On the postpartum comment, <clears throat> they followed up and said, postpartum period is a transition time for individual, family, and community. Lots of change occurs during this time frame. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, yeah. 
And change can be good and change can be difficult, right? But even when changes are good, it can be, it's a transition time. Okay, so then we'll talk about kind of what midwives do and what doulas do to kind of help ease that, that transition for people. So uh, midwives and midwifery care. So um, midwives, if you, so in terms of midwifery care, in case you're not familiar with, with what that is, as primary care providers working with well people throughout uh, pregnancy, uh, childbirth, and, and postpartum. So we view childbirth as normal and healthy. Um, and so you're not being told that anything's wrong with you, which is uh, a confidence booster for some people. We practice informed choice, so we help to um, give you lots of information and answer your questions and take the time to make sure you feel good about the decisions you're making for your body and for your family. Choice of birthplace, so midwives attend birth in hospital and also out of hospital. That may be your home or the home of a loved one. Um, continuity of care, we'll see uh, the same people throughout pregnancy and throughout their whole journey to baby um, and also sometimes we see people for a second or third or fourth pregnancy as well. Um, collaboration, we work with other health professionals and other um, care providers in the community, so physicians and, and you know, so obstetricians and pediatricians and nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, doulas, uh, lactation consultants, you name it, um, um, we'll make those connections and collaborate. Um, uh, we, uh, you know, try to treat people as respectfully as possible and also practice cultural safety. Um, uh, support for the natural process, so we're trying to intervene when we need to and not when we don't need to. And, um, and Indigenous midwives have always been around, so it's not a new thing, even though people are learning about midwifery for the first time, it's not a new thing. We've, we've always been here. And so one quote from uh, a mother was, what did I not love about having a midwife? He took the time to really get to know me, which made me feel comfortable and important, like I had a say in how things would be, that my voice really mattered. And I thought that was a really powerful thing to say about her experience. In terms of the postpartum care that midwives provide, I believe that our most significant impact on the postpartum period is actually in preparing for that in pregnancy. So in pregnancy, we're working on the relationship with the body. We're, you know, encouraging people, and and um, you know, when we're looking at pregnancy as normal and healthy, that helps people to feel uh, healthy as well. Um, we're encouraging bonding with the family, bonding with the baby in pregnancy, preparing the home and the family. So supporting people to go through that that work. Um, and then planning for mood changes. So some people know that the postpartum time will be particularly difficult for them. Say they've already had a diagnosis of, of uh, clinical depression or bipolar disorder or what have you. And so some people know that this is going to be really especially challenging for them. So we do some planning. We say, okay, well, Maybe for a week after the baby's been born, you'll see your counselor. Maybe you'll see uh, your prescriber, so whether that's your family doctor or psychiatrist at a certain time. Um, that there, maybe there's a social work team involved and that we're connecting with them and we're making sure that that kind of um, continuity and that network of support is there and we're kind of anticipating those challenges before they come. Um, one of the things that uh, is really important as midwives is to uh, preserve the intactness of families and do what we can so that that bonding and that preparation is taking place and we, in that way we can hopefully reduce child apprehension. We know that when people are supported through that whole process that their, um, the afterwards part um, is going to be better. And then bonding with the baby between the parents or the family members who are in, in the household and with family and with the whole community and trying to welcome that new life in a meaningful way and the more we connect in with the community and help people to do that and reach out um, and encourage communities to welcome their newest community members in a good way really building that support network we think that that's just a really beautiful way to come into the world and also to be supported as parents um, so uh, in terms of the you know, hands-on that we do. So we provide home visits. We'll visit people in hospital and in the nursery if their baby's been admitted to the 
intensive care unit, um, support with feeding the baby, um, which can be a, a particular challenge, especially if people haven't seen breastfeeding happen before, or they don't know how to feed a baby, whatever feeding choice they make. Um, addressing mood changes and seeing if people need to be linked with resources for that. Ensuring healing from the birth, so an actual physical recovery from birthing and being present and as helpful as possible uh, through those big changes and transitions of the postpartum time. And so um, Carol Cucci is an Indigenous midwife uh, in the community where I come from, uh, and which is Nipissing, and she says the most powerful medicine we have as Indigenous midwives is to help restore and strengthen that sacred bond between babies and families which is such a beautiful way to say it. And then I was recently at the elders conference in Edmonton and a, a, a couple with their baby came by our booth and we were talking about the impact of midwifery and the mother, her name is Shalom, she said, we are healing a generation, our son is healthy, he hasn't been traumatized and he hasn't been taken from us. And that was so powerful too. So I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> All right, so in terms of um, the type of supports and care that doulas offer um, specific to the postpartum time, I'll start just by um, backing up a little bit and um, talking more about what a doula is. So um, this word doula may be um, new or unfamiliar to you. Um, the term itself actually has um, its roots in the Greek word for um, slave or one who serves, um, which doesn't entirely um, reflect, I think, what um, the role of what a doula is all of the time or the role of a doula in an Indigenous community, um, which tends to be um, more relationship-based. So um, in our collective, we um, prefer the term birth auntie or birth worker um, or even just helper. Um, as terms that reflect more the historical and ongoing nature of this role in our communities, um, where births were usually attended by midwives and helpers. Um, and um, also, um, those who became doulas were often mentored by um, people in their families, like um, Evelyn mentioned, and in my family too, um, my grandmother was delivered by her grandmother. Um, so um, it it's sort of like a natural progression of roles within families and mentorship that happens in our communities. Um, and so this is what it sort of looked like before the biomedicalization of birth. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about what full spectrum care is because um, this isn't exactly a paradigm that is practiced by all doulas or um, that is um, necessarily um, the type of training that all doulas receive in some of the more popular um, training programs, but um, this is a term that originates in the reproductive justice movement, which is a movement spearheaded by feminists of color and indigenous feminists um, to demand full reproductive rights, human rights, and indigenous rights as crucial to the well-being um, of women and um, also self-identified women. So that's sort of um, where that term comes from and that's the type of care that um, the doulas in our collective are committed to providing. Um, so the type of care that we provide is, um, as I said earlier, it's non-clinical, compassionate and non-judgmental care to families of all makeups and birthing persons of all gender identities. Um, we help to alleviate anxieties for families through providing information, um, knowledge, um, care, and um, a huge part of our role is just in um, listening. Um, we also help clients um, process their birth stories and experiences um, after birth and the postpartum period. That's um, really important, I think, um, for, for families to um, make meaning out of that time and that experience and if something um, you know, traumatic happened to heal from that. Um, and so um, as we sort of talked about before, birth and new parenting can be a very isolating experience for families and mothers. Um, so it's important 
um, that we as doulas can let families know um, that they're not alone in some of their experiences and challenges um, and also through help to help connect them to other resources that exist um, in the communities where we're located. So that's um, so it's sort of some of the big support that we provide. And then we also, like throughout um, all of these interactions with the healthcare system, can be there for families to sort of hold space for informed consent, um, which Evelyn mentioned earlier. So through, um, because I think that um, some of those interactions um, as, as mothers and as pregnant people can feel very vulnerable or overwhelming and sometimes um, when you know doctors or midwives are explaining to us some of our options it, it's hard to fully take all of that information and process it and your own value system at the same time so as doulas we can just be there um, as extra ears to listen and to um, have conversations after with our families and our clients and help to remind them sometimes um, especially in the birth setting which is like you're almost in a different um, realm as um, the birthing person to sort of hold on to some of the things that we've heard from our mothers and families about what's important to them and be someone to check in with and um, just remind them and ask them and double check with them um, just so that they really feel like they're giving consent because I think that's a huge part of um, having a healthy and empowered birth experience. Um, and so how people can access a doula um, in their communities I think is different within every community. Um, in Vancouver um, there's, you can go online, I think, and ask, find doulas in the province. Um, I understand that the First Nations Health Authority um, has um, a resource list of doulas around the pro province that are um, available through um, the Ab Doulas for Aboriginal Families grant. There's also um, the Doula Services um, Association, the DSA, maintains a list online that um, people can find. And then um, I also included, I think, in for this uh, webinar, a link to our website, Equatal, um, so people can find Indigenous doulas that are working in Vancouver. Um, but so accessing a doula is not part of the pu public health care system. It is a private form of health care, um, which is somewhat unfortunate because it does create barriers to um, having a doula um, through your pregnancy and birth. Um, and as part of your pregnancy experience. And I just read the other night that actually in the Netherlands, their um, public health care system funds 40 hours of doula care in the postpartum period. And unfortunately, we don't have that um, here in BC. Um, we do have the grant initiative, um, which I think has been really successful so far from what I understand. Um, not all of the doulas, um, the indigenous doulas that are working in our collective are able to um, be funded through that grant. So there, there is some like, I don't know, bureaucratic kinks that still need to work, be worked out in terms of um, allowing all families to have access to an indigenous doula. But um, our collective is um, of the mind that all families should be able to have access to doulas if um, they want one. Um, so that is part of like the activism that we do as indigenous doulas is to meet families where they're at and to provide either doulas um, who work on a volunteer basis or on a sliding scale basis. And I think there's many doulas throughout the province that work that way. Um, so if you or families that you're connected to do want a doula, I encourage you to um, sort of reach out and try to find a way to make that happen because um, I think there's many doulas who um, really believe in providing that kind of care. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Lynette, can you tell us, tell us a little bit about the picture on this slide? Oh yeah, so that's a picture of myself and my daughter, Kirsten. Um I think she's 10 weeks old in that picture. Um, beautiful. Yeah. So, so I'm sort of, I think, staging a swaddle in that photo. <laughs> that swaddling. <laughs> swaddling was a big part of the early postpartum days <laughs> for, for us. <laughs> Um, yeah, and so I think the next slide. 
So more specifically um, around postpartum doula care, um, as I mentioned, um, as doulas we hold space for parents and caregivers to practice self-care. So sometimes we're in people's homes and giving um, mama a chance to take a bath or to feed herself or to catch a nap. Um, we sort of can teach and role model to other family members around what it looks like to sort of mother a mother during the postpartum period, which is, I think, a really important way that other family members can um, provide support to moms who are doing so much work um, feeding baby um, and just caring for baby and bonding with baby and don't really have a lot of um, energy or capacity to do um, much more than that during that time. But, um, you know, just showing dads and other um, other people and families like you know how to just make sure that there's always a glass of water next to mom make sure that they have like good like pillows and support under their arms during breastfeeding so that they're not straining or injuring themselves and um, just sort of yeah being that person to show what that kind of support looks like um, we also support the transformation of family roles becoming um, a mom and a dad and a grandma and all of these things is like something that in one sense totally happens overnight and instantly but in another sense is um, you know there's lots of growing pains like as there always is during times of change and um, I think baby is such an amazing teacher um, and so as doulas we can sort of just help to ease that transition by even just talking to families and holding space for those conversations to happen um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we, we hold those stories from the birth experience and, and help people make meaning of that um, experience and just asking families, you know, what that experience was like, um, letting that conversation happen, I think is really important. And, um, and you know, if things came up for mom um, during that time that they didn't have the opportunity really to process in the moment, um, letting moms and families return to that and um, ask questions, you know, why did this happen? Or um, I wasn't sure about this, or in the moment I couldn't say this, or whatever. Um, but without having those conversations, I think sometimes um, we might not understand or feel um, maybe there, there could be harm that comes out of that, I think, without the opportunity to really share and make sense of it sometimes. Um, and then a huge part of what we do as postpartum doulas is to provide support for breastfeeding um, and lactation consultants do this as well, midwives do this as well, um, but even just connecting families to more breastfeeding supports if they're um, s struggling with this because it can be really easy and natural and it can also be really challenging and difficult. Um, it was for me and um, there was like several times where I wanted to, to give up and I because I had support I didn't um, but that's sort of not talked about often in our communities or in society is how challenging breastfeeding can be so um, as doulas we um, sort of just support through that process and if families don't want to breastfeed um, we support those decisions as well whatever you know we're really our role is just to um, honor the autonomy um, and leadership of families and deciding on the kind of care that works best for them um, and um, the other thing the last thing I put there was sort of advocating for communities to support families and infants in the postpartum stage so like for myself um, coming as a new mother as a new breastfeeding mother I found you know, trying to get out to community events and be in the outside world was very difficult. Um, and, you know, it was, there was a lot of, uh, I don't know if it was pressure, but encouragement to get outside and to not isolate myself, and that was important. But then I found, like, just even trying to be somewhere and sit, try to find a place to sit or, like, you know, water or food or snacks because you have this insane appetite and you're thirsty all the time. and. Um, like none of that was really there and I think as indigenous communities we have really strong beautiful teachings around how to care for moms and um, and around breastfeeding um, but there's always like room for improvement and more that we could do um, to make sure that there are 
like seats reserved for um, new moms and places for um, to breastfeed and, and that you know when elders are being served water that breastfeeding moms are being served water as well that kind of thing so that's part of some of the advocacy that we do alongside advocating within the health system to um, fund doulas or help make doulas available to families um, and that's a picture of myself um, with um, the cradle board that um, I made with the help of my daughter's auntie Dina um, breastfeeding Keista. Um, and so this was a quote um, that I wanted to share from Loretta Ross, who's one of the um, a feminist of color from the United States who sort of helped spearhead the reproductive justice movement. So she says that through compassion and dedication, contemporary doulas are creating a new tradition and demonstrating profound expressions of feminism in action. Um, so this is how I see being a doula as I see it as um, like living my indigenous teachings and some of the teachings that are um, the most sacred to me. Um, it's me putting that into action and I think that's what we as birth workers are, are trying to do in a sense. Um, so time for more questions to our audience. Um, can I see if they have questions first yeah. for us and then you can do yeah. some yeah. reflecting? Okay, yeah. let's say questions for after. Oh, yeah. that, or, no, no, I mean there are questions in the chat right now uh, so far. Okay. But yeah, feel free. Yeah, let's jump right in. Okay. Um, so yeah, if anyone does have a question about anything that was just said, feel free to ask or feel free also to answer some of these questions that we are posing to you. Um, so one was just um, what you see the role of Indigenous midwives and doulas. Um, what do you see as our role in the wellness of um, our Indigenous communities? And um, you know, I'm based in Vancouver, so it's a very urban context, and um, some of you, I think, are in different types of community settings, so we're really interested to hear what you have to say around that. Um, and then also, so we have the saying that it takes a village to raise a child, which I think um, is, you know, a very, like, um, makes a lot of sense to us as Indigenous people, but I'm, uh, we're wondering how can we all strive to uphold our collective responsibilities to families during the postpartum period from wherever we stand. So going back to what I was just saying around, you know, when we organize an event or um, when we go to visit somebody or, or, you know, when we're designing and delivering a program or whatever that looks like, how can we support um, new families? We can leave it there and see if we get anything, mm -hmm. yeah. anything in. So please feel free to put in your answers in the chat box. Here you have someone writing. So, and what you were saying about having different community contexts, like somebody said something about when people are evacuated to other communities mm -hmm. and they're completely alone. And Absolutely. now we know that, you know, most people have an escort now in BC, which is, which is good, but still being so far and isolated and escorts can't always stay the whole length of time that you need to be away from home. It can be such a time of high stress and um, having a referral process to midwives and doulas from the community to have a supportive network when people arrive here mm -hmm. would be such a nice start for for that kind of thing and gradually working towards bringing birth back to our community so people don't have to go places, right, right, to, right, to have their babies, or at least most people, but, you know, we're in such a situation right now that wherever we're receiving people, it would be such an amazing thing to have that support network, like an anti-network mm -hmm. for people, you know? Totally. So that's one of our um, collective's um, visions, is that we would be able to provide support to families who are coming to Vancouver under their routine evacuation policy. Um, just, you know, as um, people who can provide that kind of like loving support and warmth and a welcome and um, yeah, a little bit of familiarity, I guess. Um, we are sort of challenged by how to um, cut across some of the, the systems that are in place that I, we're not really sure where to start in terms of creating those relationships to get connected to families who are um, coming to Vancouver and I know that this happens like it's quite a stressful time and and so planning for that and being available for that um, 
does require some organization and creative um, out of the box thinking so um, yeah we're hoping sort of that um, we can eventually create relationships with the health authorities around the province or communities specifically um, to be there for families who um, yeah are leaving their communities and coming to Vancouver because I can't imagine how stressful that would be. We have a couple questions coming up. Uh, one is uh, midwifery is now covered through MSP. It would be useful to support individuals, families, communities by having doulas part of the medical services system. Many families cannot afford the services of a doula, sadly. And uh, is there any movement to gain the support within the medical system? That's the question. Um, movement on the, it's from the same, the same yes. regards to the same issue. Yeah. Did, did you really make that point? Well, just in to respond to the question of if there is a movement towards um, having doulas as part of the medical system, I've heard kind of some murmurs about that, but I haven't heard anything specific or anything, any solid plans. What I do know that is, um, like very often, if, if they wanted to do that, they would want to put some controls and some limitations and and kind of, um, standardized, yeah, doula work, which I think that there's, um, you know, for something that doesn't, it's not a clinical thing, it's like a social support. I don't know that, like, you know, in my humble opinion, I don't know if that's really necessary. Um, and I, I think that that forms a barrier actually to having, um, being able to respond to our communities in the way that we need to. I think doula work, like what we call doula work now, or the birth helper work, has always been there. It's, it's what you say, there's always been helpers, and it's a bit frustrating actually that we can't just look at it the same way now, now that there has been a word put to it and a certification put to it somewhere that for our communities where we've always had this kind of thing, that we're also held to that um, standard where where we need to create maybe our own sense of what that means for our communities and fight for that to be recognized in some way that's meaningful. Um, you know, these are all those like long-term dreams <laughs> of yeah. things I would love for people, everyone to be able to have the support they need and that would include a, a midwife if they chose and a doula if they chose. Mm -hmm. And you're right that midwife um, care is paid for um, with a, your like it's free of charge and unless you don't have a health card mm -hmm. um, and even then if you're a refugee there are ways to obtain the, the care of a midwife mm -hmm. um, but doulas and midwives what's really important to kind of make the point of that um, just because you have a midwife doesn't mean you can't have a doula just because you have a doula doesn't mean you can't also have a midwife just because um, you know, like that it's not mutually exclusive. Having one doesn't mean you can't have the other. We kind of really enjoy working together and really enjoy um, what we can bring families when we pool our resources together. And, and in that, I mean like in, in our resources in terms of what it is that we can bring to that family. Um, and, and I think it's just important to say that because I think there's a movement to try to get doulas doing work and then it distracts from having midwives in that area but we need both like we really need to support both and both I think are part of helping to build a healthy picture of, of um, childbirth for our communities. Mm -hmm. So whereas there isn't necessarily a movement to try to make doulas a part of the medical system, I think there, there is, there is but I don't know what progress has been made on it. Mm -hmm. But it does sound like there are people who are trying to in place system so that there's grants at least for so more people have access to doulas so that may be a bit of a movement to try to make it more available to more people yeah so the doulas for aboriginal families grant program i believe that's the name is um, through first nations health authority and is uh, organized through the bc association for aboriginal friendship centers and if you go to their website the um, information is available there about um, becoming, if, if you have doula certifications, then you can uh, register as a doula as part of that program, right? Mm -hmm. And then also if, if you are a family who's going to be birthing, um, you guys can apply for, to have, have some of that doula care covered. And what we're saying is that it's challenging because even though our role as birth helpers um, has evolved over time and has always been there, 
um, that in these kinds of situations there are barriers to, to being able to kind of um, stand strong in our, in our ways and um, kind of claim that role as a helper, right? Yeah. yeah. So we have another comment, uh, not so much a question. Um, it's about, um, sorry, I'm trying to scroll up, about support, community support. Um, I was very fortunate with my mother and mother-in-law who helped with house cleaning, laundry, and dishes. Uh, and every so often would cook a meal. Had five children and the last four were a year and a half apart each. Some women in our community shared their breast milk with those who were struggling with their breast milk. That's one way of support. Another and person that's actually yeah. that's actually a traditional practice as mm -hmm. well, like sisters and cousins, and and that was a common thing to do. Mm -hmm. And for some people, that if they their sisters, their kids would call them both mum. Mm -hmm. Like that, that's a uh, something that is um, um, traditional, and and um, I think that it's amazing that someone brought that up because what what an amazing way to support someone when you need to go and do something and some of your babies being watched and they can provide that to them. Mm -hmm. Of course, we know that not everybody is in a position to do that now and that, that may not always be the best way to do things for everybody now, but there are situations where it is appropriate and it's good to hear that that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, someone else says, we were told the Aboriginal doula program is no more since April. It's restarted. <laughs> the funds were not renewed, she said. So it's restarted, apparently. Oh, I got, I got a message to say that it was renewed okay. um, sometime in the summer, I think. they. Yeah, so okay. maybe we need to do, can we follow up later on? Like if sure. we contact them and maybe we'll put that on The Aboriginal Friendship people. Center and, and, and the Duba? Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I, I got the message to say that they were up and going again. So um, yeah, as far as I know, that's accurate yeah the, as far as I know the funds were reinstated in July yeah okay yeah right. so maybe there's a just yeah. three months long period but it was uh, yeah it was okay. um, off for a while and yeah. I, I don't know how much of an announcement has been made around the reinstatement of those funds okay. great yeah I'm happy I'm happy you asked that question and uh, you got thank you for your response uh, it is double-edged sword when services are governed by regulations mm -hmm on that previous question about um, whether doula services would be part of the medical system. Okay. Uh, someone else said, yes, the BCAAFC doula grant has been renewed until February of 2018. And someone else said, BCAAFC doula funds are available, applications available on their website. Mm -hmm. there we Thank go. you for confirming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks so much for looking that up. Um, yeah. yeah, I think I just wanted also to touch on, um, while this grant program I think is a really, um, like awesome initiative for the short term. Um, like we do need to think about more sustainable solutions for having this kind of support available to families and our communities and um, how we can support that. And I think um, one of the sort of, I think, unfortunate outcomes of um, this sort of like reinvention of the role of a doula, um, like in more of a, a biomedical sense and in, in the biomedical system is that it's become very individualized and almost um, encouraged to be run um, as, a, as a sort of like business model which I don't think necessarily speaks to the way that this role um, functioned in our communities um, prior to colonization and um, I think for myself like I would envision health authorities or even specific organizations or community health centers um, or um, whatever type of organization just even trying to create a role like for maybe a full-time salaried doula who could work um, with you know an unlimited number of families um, at whatever time rather than because it is really difficult for doulas as well um, as well as families to access doulas, but doulas also need to, um, you know, pay their bills and take care of their families and get childcare for their children and all of those things. Um, so it just becomes really difficult to to access a doula and also to serve as a doula um, the way that I think the system is set up now um, to just sort of get a one-time payment for every birth that you do. Um, so if there is um, room to have those conversations in your communities or your organizations. Um, on how you could just, yeah, maybe um, 
fund doulas to be a part of the system, I think that could be um, really potentially valuable and also maybe create, um, create resources for um, doulas and helpers to um, create some more like long-term infrastructure like um, you know in I in my head if I was a salaried full-time doula um, or a birth worker I could support families and I could also manage my time so that I was um, in my off time from working with families like creating training curriculum for prenatal classes that were um, relevant to my own community or um, like talking circles for postpartum moms or whatever that is I think um, I just think that the role could look really differently if we sort of return to what it is that um, we want from that role um, as indigenous peoples and communities and um, we could sort of get more creative around that. I think it's all part of a larger conversation around um, respect and honor for women's traditional roles in our communities and that goes for midwives and for doulas and birth helpers and um, a lot of other things that we do in our communities and bringing back that honor and that respect for that and acknowledging that this is stuff that's always been there. Um, you know, at the Elders Conference in Edmonton, it was pretty amazing because none of our, our whole shipment of pamphlets didn't come in. <laughs> so we had nothing for our whole table. <laughs> and so what we did is we put a sign there and then we said, tell us your midwife stories. And every single elder who walked past our booth, they read that and they said, I have a midwife story. And they told us a midwife story and they all had that. And we said, you know what? We would love to honor the midwives um, for their work and honor the family. And, and you know, we learned where they're from and their names, but not a single one was living anymore. And that represents such a huge loss culturally. Um, and, and um, you know, the midwifery in the way that we do it now is very different from the way that it was always done. Um, and there are people who are really trying to bring a lot of that back. Um, and, and that's really challenging now with so many of our traditional knowledge keepers who um, have passed away or, or maybe don't have that experiential knowledge. So maybe somebody passed that down to their, their, their daughter or their nephew or, or, you know, somebody. And then, but because that person hasn't been doing that work and doing and having that experiential knowledge of midwifery, um, a lot of that, it, um, we have to work really, really hard now to, to bring that back. And I think now is the perfect time with the truth and reconciliation calls to action and with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Like if there was ever a time to say our communities want this back, mm -hmm. we can do that now. And like this is the whole point of getting this whole conversation going is we want people to know what their options are for what kind of line of work they want to do. So do you want to become a midwife or a birth helper or a doula? Do you want the care of a midwife or a doula, right? Mm -hmm. Those are important options to know about, but also for your community. You may not be the one giving birth. You may not be the one to want to do this kind of work, but maybe you're the one who can see the value of a whole community being supported at such an incredible flashpoint in life. It's such an important time in life to be supported because it can go so well when things are being lifted up, people are being lifted up, and it can go so badly when people don't feel supported. And it's just one of those times where you're like, okay, you guys, like, let's, let's do this. Let's be there for our communities. And when you think about all of the community ills that are there, you know, I feel like we can trace that back, right, to birthing and how supported our mothers were and our parents were through those changes in that time. And for communities who are evacuated for birth, that's an amazing point in life that people don't get to share in. And that's really big deal too. So, you know, this is just a really good time to be having these conversations and thinking for ourselves, like, what does my community need? What does my family need? And how can I be creative and respond to that? And not think about what's already out there, but think about what we can create together. We have two comments. Yeah. One is, it would be nice to have bands involved in the cost for birth helpers and doulas. 
Um, do you want to respond to that, or I can go to the second comment if you like? Let's hear the next one. Uh -huh. all, yeah. uh, thank you for bringing this forward. Business, quotes, is so far from what traditional birth support is or was, and I'm afraid it may be leaning towards the what we see in our healthcare system, in particular, maternal health. I see many practitioners design, schedule, coordinate response to allow for numbers and the bottom line. So this sounds like a concern for how things are getting a little corporatized or, or just kind of the business yeah. aspect taking over. And that speaks to how people really feel like a number in the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. it, that's that like an anonymity, that feeling of like nobody knows me, right? And yeah. it's true. And as a as a healthcare provider and as a healthcare recipient, so I'm someone who's also part of the healthcare system, receiving healthcare. You know, it does feel that way, and it you do wish that there was more um, meaningful relationships that we we're able to form. Part of it is because when we're under resourced, we don't have very many healthcare providers to provide that level of care to everybody we're stretched thin and people are burning out and so then they feel like they need to be able to walk away more from work and you know like they, a small group of people need to see a lot more people and it can be really stressful as a healthcare provider um, but that doesn't take away from what our communities need from us and so you know there has to be a balance there and I think part of that balance is just our communities saying like what do we need and what do we want to ask for and what do we want to fight for? Does someone from the community want to learn this work and take that up themselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, because there are lots of different ways to do that and people who aren't getting into the UBC program are going to, I heard now, are going to Ontario because they have so many more spots there. Mm -hmm. If that's the way of learning midwifery that you want to do, then, then you know, they have eight Indigenous students starting their first year at Ryerson this year. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. You know, it's great because they've managed to expand the program and do that. There's a very reconciliation-based perspective on how to bring back Indigenous midwives and, and doing that, right? Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And so it's like, okay, great. That's a great example. Do we follow that? How do we do that? Or what do we do instead? But let's be thinking about it and taking action on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's it for a comment. Um, I would just add to that and say that um, I think one of the other limitations that's created by the healthcare system from what I see as a doula um, on midwives and doctors is that like traditionally a midwife would be able to attend a birth and be um, at the mother's side, you know, like ongoing throughout the birth as a continuing support. And now um, I think midwives have a lot of paperwork requirements um, throughout the birth which um, you know makes sense in, in certain ways and so doulas can sort of complement that role as somebody who can be by mom's side throughout the birth um, but um, it, it makes me think of you know that idea that I shared earlier around if doulas were to be um, funded or to sit within organizations part of my concern around that is then what would be our reporting requirements and how much of our role would get taken away then um, from just being able to work with families one-on-one -on -one in, into like reporting and paperwork and so I think um, when we do have these sort of like out of the box conversations on how what these roles need to look like and what we need from birth workers in our communities um, we also have to think about how we can respect and honor the autonomy of birth workers to do what they need to do um, otherwise I think those yeah roles can get bogged down by bureaucracy and that does take away from just the the kind of support that we need to be providing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah it's very challenging Cool. So if you have any more questions, um, please feel free to, to send them our way. Yeah. You have great images of this. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe somebody has a midwife or doula story of their own that they'd like to yeah. share. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If anyone has questions, go for it. I'm curious where everybody is coming in from. Do we have any idea where people are, or if everybody's in BC, or? I don't know, let's ask. I'm 
curious if you, like if for you in your community, wherever you are, if you're able to access a midwife or a doula. Mm -hmm. We have 29 people online. After we had 37. 37. Mm -hmm. That's more than half the registered. Yeah. We've got Kelowna, BC, Regina, Saskatchewan, Campbell River, but working out of Courtney, Vancouver, Vancouver again, Kamloops, Comox. Those are all places that have midwives. <laughs> Ottawa. Yeah, cool. Wow, thanks for joining, joining us from far and wide. It's beautiful. <laughs> Chase, BC. So it seems ben like, Imo. I'm not sure if Chase has midwives. And Imo does. It's very cool. So it's, it sounds like this information uh, is known to a lot of people, probably, like that, that people know uh, about midwifery. They're well-served, mostly well-served communities. For Chase, they say that they come from the community from Cam to the community from Kamloops. Okay. Mm. Okay. Great. Nice when we have midwives who can kind of spread their reach a little bit and reach our community. Sheila, Say Wilton, Health Center, Couch and Tribes. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Awesome. Yeah. Does anyone feel like pitching in on the conversation about having doulas as a funded profession, I guess it would be? Mm -hmm. Or Yeah, because right now it's it's sort of like a contractual basis, I mean like a freelance basis, sort of, right, and that's, that, that must be difficult to sustain for the doulas. Or if anyone knows about any local indigenous midwives or, or people who have that kind of birth knowledge, if that's accessible to people. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious if people are able to access, uh, you know, if, if they know um, people in their community who can talk to them in their pregnancy or mm -hmm. when they've had their baby or in the postpartum time. Port Hardy, there is birthing in Port McNeil for low-risk births and delivery is in Campbell River South. There are doulas in the community, however, I don't believe that it is broad knowledge to Aboriginal mothers or new mothers. That it's what knowledge? That it's, uh, the, that it's known to, to um, Aboriginal mothers or new mothers. Well, hopefully this is helping us move yeah, forward. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, hopefully. We have two community agencies who provide doulas on a volunteer basis, not sure if they are being funded or volunteer, etc. And where, where are you from, Nicola? Nicola? Courtney. Okay, thanks. And Courtney. Okay. Great. Right. Very cool. Well, thank you everyone who's been pitching into joining in on the conversation and Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Did you have questions written yourself, or? Um, well, I, I before the session started, I, I asked a little bit about um, uh, knowledge around uh, post postpartum. I don't know if it should be called postpartum depression or not, but after breastfeeding ends, I was looking this up myself a few days ago. On uh, when when you finish breastfeeding your child. Um, uh, you know what what happens to the body and and sort of um, are there risks of, of um, sort of a postpartum postpartum depression like situation and that that's something that I that I read a little bit about but I didn't find much information so I was curious to know uh, a little bit about that and and uh, I thought maybe that might interest uh, some of the people here to to be aware of it you know if, if it's a thing that um, uh, you you can go through changes after uh, finishing uh, breastfeeding your child. Yeah, I mean, I can say that when it's a physiological change to not be producing milk anymore, right? Yeah. There's a lot of hormones involved in that. And also that continuous surge of happy hormones right. um, and that breastfeeding gives you, yeah. it, it ends, it stops, right? Yeah. So it makes sense that there's a transition time and a readjustment time. Um, and our moods follow our hormones and our hormones follow our moods and it's kind of all over the map until things get back into a regular rhythm again. 
settle out and, and when you can start predicting your own rhythm again makes a huge difference too so mm -hmm. yeah those kinds of things make sense I don't have you know anything in front of me to read out to people about right that, but it makes yeah. sense what you say I wonder if there's much research about it and I, I think that's part of the problem with uh, birthing and and uh, you know uh, postpartum period like there isn't necessarily that much information out there and I think it's all the more important for um, that community support to be there to happen so that um, you know families can support each other and share that knowledge amongst themselves because the internet doesn't necessarily provide that for you. And sometimes <laughs> where, the, where the information is housed isn't always accessible yes. or easy to approach, right? right? And it can be very challenging, yeah. yeah. I think that there are a lot of things in our communities that we would do better by talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and really kind of when we take the judgment out of all of these kinds of things that we can really just be there for one another um, and be supportive towards one another and and I think that bringing back that sense of community is really important around having children and um, birthing babies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. I think Indigenous mothers um, especially really come up against a stigma that um, is very entrenched in Canadian society that we're bad mothers and I think that that is the way that that stigma functions sometimes is to really silence us and to not speak out when we're um, encountering difficulties um, but socially I think it is so important that we create environments where um, moms and grandmothers and aunties can connect with each other so that they can talk about these things because mm -hmm. it's one thing to experience all of those physiological changes and to know that those are you know just you know science or natural or whatever but to actually be able to just hear from other mo mothers in your community that hey this happened to me too mm -hmm. and this is what I tried and this is what I did or even to just hear from somebody that it happened to them too is so important and um, I wanted to share like accessing a doula might not be accessible um, or affordable or whatever for every family but I think that we all do have social networks and something that I read the other night was that um, you know families often go through so many um, steps and do, um, put out so much effort to prepare for a new baby's arrival in terms of like all the gear that you get set yeah. up and, and all of those things and you've got blankets and you've got your crib and you've got all these things but people forget to um, put into place for that post early postpartum time um, connection and supports that are going to be there so but that's actually the really only thing that you need exactly. um, mm -hmm. you know you don't need a mama root you don't need a babysitter you yeah. need somebody to come by and check on you and make sure that you're doing okay and um, just to ask how your day has been yeah. and whatever especially single yeah. moms like I was a single mom um, having a new baby so um, if I think you know, indigenous peoples have always done that. We've always invested in our relationships and that's such a huge strength that already exists in our community. So just um, encouraging that and putting in some processes around that so that new families um, make sure that um, they've got that support network that's going to check in on them in their early days of um, new motherhood and new family life, I think is crucial. And that can happen with or without a doula. And I think what you say, just to continue on that thread about um, the difficulty with asking for help, feeling like um, we're being held to a stereotype of bad mothering, I think that's really powerful. And I think that actually a lot, I and mean, we know actually Indigenous people seek out health care later and less and, and usually results in poorer health outcomes. We know that. Um, and, and this is no different and what we want is better health outcomes and when you think about if you could approach someone from within your own community to help you with something, how much easier that would maybe be. For some people maybe that would be a, more of a barrier but for the vast majority of people if it's, some, if it's someone in your own community who understands the context of your community and the context of your challenges, you're not going to feel uncomfortable asking for help and that's the power of having midwives in the community or doulas in the community and not just when you get to Vancouver um, because uh, so much of life happens when you're not at the hospital and 
it life happens mostly when you're not at the hospital and that's where you need the support and so um, you know our our health outcomes are better when we can access health care more willingly and more openly and sooner and so I think that that's the power of taking care of our own communities too and having people who are there who are a trusted person within the community we have a couple more comments. Um, one is from Ashley Simpson who says, I coordinate a pregnancy outreach program at our local friendship center and we are very lucky to be able to con contract doulas through our program and offer that service to our families free of charge. Mm -hmm. We also heavily utilize the BCAAFC grant program. So that's great. Thanks for sharing because we want the word to get out so that people know about these things. Um, let's see, we've got another from... Barb Sir says, I live and work in Caslow, BC, but I'm originally from North Bay, Ontario. Yay in BC Nation. Mm -hmm. Caslow is a community of a thousand people, and we are lucky to have one midwife among us. The pregnancy outreach program I coordinate receives minimal funds from the Ministry for Child and Family Development for our home support program. This provides postpartum doula-like service, though not by registered doulas, to families. Not comment uh, to families who are struggling. Unfortunately, the, fun the funding is quite minimal, so there are generally only one or two families receiving this at any given time. I'm grateful to be able to offer something, but everyone could use this kind of help. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have someone. Oh, there's multiple people typing right now, so give me a minute. <laughs> Some aha moments happening, I think. <laughs> It is really unfortunate how, um, like, women's work has, you know, historically been exploited. I think under capitalism, and especially birth workers, um, like doulas who work privately, really struggle to be um, paid for their services, and at the same time, really believe in providing them um, to the point that, like, they would do the work for free. Um, without much issue, but um, one of the unfortunate consequences of, of that is that um, as women and as birth workers, we often have to rely on men or other people to be able to keep our households going, even though we want to do that work. And so I think um, as communities, if um, we do struggle to get funding for these kinds of um, roles or helpers, that we do find other ways still to take care of these people like um, you know just through providing like gifts of food or whatever that looks like so that um, birth workers can still um, do their work and take care of their families I think is um, really important um, sort of grassroots way to keep that momentum going. Got someone who's saying oops Thank you for your comments about how important non-judgment is to healthy mom and baby and community. Mm -hmm. um, Shelly is saying, I wonder if public health nurses are utilized to the fullest in their outlying neighborhoods, especially during the postpartum period. I can only speak for my local community and I can say that they they really do have a pretty far reach and they, they um, make a point to visiting everybody who has either requested a visit or their provider has requested a visit for them and they see them at the timing that is needed so it is a um, it's a as extensive of a service as what it's intended to be uh, in the community where I work which is the Kelowna area. Sheila says doulas not only help with labor and delivery but also advocate for parents keep a connection with their baby when baby has been apprehended by MCFD. Allowing mothers to continue to breastfeed their babies through pumping and freezing the, the breast milk helps continue the bonding process until baby is returned to his or her parents. Advocacy is a huge part of being a doula. Yeah, and midwives do the same thing too. Yeah, that's part of it. And we're very fortunate as healthcare providers and they might pull together a team meeting and this happened more when I was in Ontario than I haven't seen it happen a whole lot in BC but um, a team meeting where you know the midwives and the social workers and the 
the client, the person who's having the baby, get together and talk about what do we need to do to set, it, like do that planning because we're anticipating potentially an apprehension or there's a threat of an apprehension and how do we do that work together to, um, to make sure that people are supported or that if there is an apprehension, which does happen, that we're maintaining as much of that bond as possible um, if that's what's wanted by the family. Typing. This has been a really wonderful session, and I thank you both. And, uh, Evelyn has tra traveled in this morning and yeah. had to take a very early flight to be here, so we're really <laughs> grateful, also, and of course, grateful to Dinan as well for having come over. Um, this is very, very important information, and um, again, you know, the, the information about uh, you know, for young for young mothers or. or uh, about the postpartum period uh, isn't always accessible to people, so I think this is a really, really valuable session, and I hope that everyone um, feels feels happily happy after this. Um, got okay. Here's one. Uh, I believe there is a room. There is room for advocacy to support birth workers, doulas, in our communities. Midwives were underground for decades and are only being financially compensated over the last couple of decades. Research identifies that doulas are an important part of the continuum of care for communities. And thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. And I just want to say too, um, on the point of advocacy, is that all my plug for indigenous doulas and birth workers that I think, um, at, like as indigenous people, that um, we are uniquely positioned to provide, um, you know, the best types of advocacy and support for people within our own communities um, as people who have an entire lifetime of experience as indigenous peoples and um, as part of indigenous families and communities and so I think it is really important that um, in community and family settings that we are paying attention to our youth and our young ones and the ones that are um, sort of showing um, early signs of having gifts for birth work mm -hmm. and um, for this type of um, caregiving um, and that those gifts are nurtured and supported and developed um, so that we can you know return this role to our communities because um, because it did always exist and it should always exist and, uh, yeah beautiful thank you and uh, Cheryl Sargent says both your work is admirable keep up the great work yes yeah. <laughs> absolutely <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> all right Cool. Do you have any um, last notes you'd like to share? No, I'd just like to thank everybody for joining us today. It's been a really great conversation, and thank you again for having me. Yeah, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our, uh, thanks everyone for, who participated, and um, some some people um, who've been really helping the background. Uh, we've got um, uh, Stefan Mladovic, who uh, helps with uh, the technical aspect of our work. We've got uh, Davina Ridley, who is uh, not in the frame right now, but who is a huge help and who helps run uh, the video conference as well as the, the webinar. Um, the whole UBCLC team and uh, in the video conference side of things, uh, David Anderson and and uh, Susan? Susan Lefebvre. Lefebvre, thank you. Uh, thanks so much. And uh, I just want to let you know about our next session. It's going to be Fall Harvest Menu with uh, Jerry Kasten uh, at the Foods and Nutrition Building and Vigis Kitchen. So that's going to be right on campus, but we're not going to be right uh, in our usual uh, webinar room for that. That's going to be on Tuesday, September 26th uh, and at 10 a.m. So please uh, register for that mm -hmm. if you're interested. And uh, again, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Mm -hmm.